Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Talking Rugby Union podcast. My name is Joe Harvey. Uh, I'm joined by fellow TRU writer Chris Heal. Chris, how are things? Good, Joe. Been a long time since we've done one of these, but I think this is the perfect time to be doing one. Yeah, definitely. With Six Nations coming up, we're joined by the man that helped us preview the Autumn awesome Nations Cup, which was, incidentally, the last podcast me and you did together, Chris. So Seems, um, Seamless, Joe. Yeah, it's seamless. It's like... Well, the thing is, if this is the only one we do before the Six Nations, this is the only one we do. It's a very consistent model that we're, we're going with, yeah. and that's the rest of that. But the man who is joining us is Charlie Beckett. Charlie, how are things? Afternoon, gents. Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. I enjoy any chance to come on and just get really nosy and chat about rugby with you fine gentlemen. So um, I'm, I'm excited for that. It's, it's good to be back. Thank you for having me back. No, I'm really glad to have you. You've actually kind of gone past us now in podcast setups with your own podcast that's going on Mate, i've i've had i think what the kids call a glow up uh since we last spoke on my podcast set. last time i was just out of my uh i was just out of my uh, laptop and you'll see now i've got my mic i've got my headphones and no i'm very fortunate that um i got approached to start my own podcast it's been in the works for probably just about nine months now or so but then i was all set to launch just before i got signed to, uh, back to gloucester in the, in the summer obviously put it on the back burner there with need to put everything into the rugby but um it's something I've been I'm I really enjoy podcasting I enjoy writing for you guys I enjoy working in the media and it was something that yeah 92 degrees the company came to me and said we'd be interested in you hosting a podcast that we sponsor and I was like look lads if you're going to give me coffee and let me talk I'm happy with that so they're two of my favorite things so no it's really good it's exciting but yeah, as I say I've got a bit of kit now so hopefully uh, people listening to this will be able to hear my uh, mutterings and rumblings uh, a little bit clearer this time than last yeah, and also, you're not in Tom Hudson's attic, I don't think, anymore. No, I'm not. I was in Tom Hudson's spare room last time. No, I've, um, lads, I've got all grown up, and I've actually moved into a flat with my girlfriend. So that's all quite, yes, yeah, I know, I know, all quite. But don't worry, there is still a tie to Gloucester Rugby. The, um, it is owned by Ed Slater and Fraser Balmain. So <laughs> they are my landlords. They've gone from my teammates to my landlords. So if this Wi-Fi goes uh, goes awry at any point, you know who to uh, who to blame. That's uh, Fraser Balmain and Ed Slater. Any any issues, please uh, please send them their way. Well, we all know Ed Slater will just slam me in some description anyway when he gets the opportunity. Um, oh, but we still, still on that, mate. Last season's press launch at Gloucester. Mate, the, Ed Slater things... <laughs> commented on your shoes. I've got the shoes somewhere. I've actually wrecked them in the snow. <laughs> That was a good call, seeing the, state of them, seeing the state of them before they were in the snow. I would have read good them Good job, Charlie. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do this podcast anymore. <laughs> um, but obviously we're here to talk Six Nations, but first things first. Charlie, I think it was two weeks ago now, because once, you know, we're in lockdown again, so I can't really remember time. Time isn't really a thing anymore again. Uh, but what real. I do know is that, yeah, exactly. And I mean, as, as we know from watching the Marvel Universe over the years, it's not real. It's not a thing. It doesn't exist. And you had a column out the other week, which was talking about the, the hashtag I care movement, which was, you know, it's obviously because of some comments that were made about women's sport, which have kind of, it keeps on periodically happening, unfortunately, every couple of months, really, at the moment. And the feedback you got from that was, was brilliant. Yeah, mate, it was, it was all a bit bonkers, wasn't it, really? Like, I am... Um... Obviously, there was the awful comments about the Women's Six Nations being uh, postponed on the Sky Sports post, and the the uh, overriding theme was who cares, which then Steph Evans of Bristol Bears uh, picked up with Ruggett, RFC, her company, they picked up the brilliant I Care campaign, and it was so great over that week. I was seeing loads of people from, from men's and women's rugby and outside of rugby, just fans explaining why they cared with the hashtag I Care um, uh, hashtag, and about, I said in my article about three or four times, I started typing a tweet to explain why I care. And I was like, I can't really do it just through a tweet or an Instagram caption. Which then suddenly it hit me. I don't know why I didn't think of it sooner. You guys very kindly afford me the platform of my column to, um, to chat about things in rugby when, when I fancy that, I, that are important to me. And I thought, well, that's the perfect place to, um, to do it. And I actually, um, I wrote it sat in a Northampton service station on my way to training at Amptill. I stopped to have my food and I wrote it there. And once I got going, I was just, it just all came out really. I didn't really know what I was going to say before I started typing. I thought I just normally have a bit of a plan with them, what I want to say. But I was like, this one, I, I think I just get typed and see what comes out. And they didn't really stop. And it was all very much from the heart. Like I'm very fortunate that I said, I said in the article, I've been 
had first-hand experience of women's rugby since a young age through Waterloo, my club at home, Jill Burns clubs. I've always grown, it's always been a women's team, so I've always grown up. So women playing rugby has been the norm for me my whole life. Uh, then obviously Sarah, my sister Sarah plays for England, so she's played since she was six or seven, so I've watched her. So I've never really thought uh, women shouldn't play rugby or it's odd that even that women play rugby because it's just been a part of my life forever. And my mum and grandma, while they haven't played, were hugely involved with the rugby club. So it's just, it's just been the norm. So... I just wanted to get across why I cared. What I didn't expect was for it to go the way it did. Like people seem to really relate to it, which is really nice. Um, quite hyper likes of Claire Balding and Judy Murray were tweeting it, and it, it seemed to transcend sports. Like I had people reaching out to me from cricket, from hockey, from um, from all sorts of walks of life and sports with their their experiences of women's sport and the challenges they faced. And I had a lot of also. Um, players I play with, have played with or played against reach out to me privately saying they didn't actually realise the abuse that is out there for women's sport and the hers because if they if they don't care, which is fine, they just scroll past, which is absolutely fine. I said in my article, not everyone has to care. Not everyone is going to care about everything. You can't, you can't. But it's the going out of your way to say things that say negative things that I don't understand. A lot of people I've played with, a lot of the lads i play with, aren't huge fans of women's rugby and that's fine they don't have to be so they hadn't seen it but actually they read my article and then they went and found the comments the person like i cannot believe this is happening so hopefully it helped raise the awareness of um of what's um, what's out there and the struggles female athletes face day to day and what they have to go through and they are i, I describe them as rock stars and they are the things they do just to be able to play at the top end of the sport it's unbelievable it's challenges we men because we're fortunate that we are a more professional setup at this moment in time, we don't have to face, we can't understand. So it was it was nice to see it have some sort of effect. I've got, I was just chatting to you boys off air about, I've got uh, a nice follow-up piece planned where I'm going to sit down with Steph um, this, this weekend, hopefully, and type it up and sit down with her. And how I want to chat about how we can all help the movement going forward, what the next steps are. So hopefully that'll be just as interesting and a good read. And really, I just want more people to see what, the challenges these women face, why why we need to help them because they do face so many challenges just because they're women and that that's nonsense. Face it because you're a woman, that's just ridiculous to me. Yeah. And it and it's unfortunately something that's come up again recently with Emma Hayes and her link to the to the AFC Wimbledon job as well. And if you can actually this brilliant video that of, of Emma talking to the press. Um I think it was today or it was yesterday or something like that. And she discusses not only is it, is it a thing about women, it's things to do with different races and, you know, kind of their involvement in uh, football and sport as a whole, actually. And it is, it is in a very important topic, as ever, to talk about. And it all stemmed from the postponement of the Women's Six Nations to apparently the day we're recording this, apparently is the day the announcement is going to be made about when that competition is going to take place, which is very much Sod's Law. Uh, Chris, you spoke to Rachel Burford, who Charlie also spoke to for his first episode of Brew with Beckett. Um, what was Rachel's thoughts and feelings about the postponement of the Women's Six Nation? Yeah, um, just just before we get on to that, Joe, I just want to go back to Charlie's columns and, and he, he said, oh, a lot of people resonate with them. And that's what I've noticed with when reading me and you obviously read Charlie's columns and have a look at them before we go out and nine times out of ten we don't have to change them because of, of the quality that Charlie puts his views across. But that's the thing feeling that I get with Charlie's recent columns that is resonating with a lot of people. And yes, we're focusing on women's rugby here, but it's about inclusivity and tackling stigmas. And I know I use tackling stigmas a lot because I, I do a bit of work for loose heads, but we had Craig Maxwell Keys on the podcast um, the other week. And he was saying, well, you know, we, we want to be diverse. We want to keep inclusivity up. I'm not going to shut up about it. If people don't like it, I'm going to keep talking about it. And the fact that Charlie's, Charlie's done one column and he's going to go, oh, I'm going to do something with Steph. I think it unfortunately needs to keep happening because as you quite rightly say, Joe, we've seen the stuff of Emma Hayes today and it's like, well, again, these comments are repeating and repeating and repeating themselves and we need to keep not shutting up about it. And I think what I've learned on TRU is our coverage of women's rugby with obviously the help of Charlie is, is continued and hopefully by discussing it more and not shutting up and letting these people have a voice, we can continue to make positive strides forward. So, um, but onto your actual question, uh, Joe, about Rachel Burford, um, She's great value, and and Charlie will know that from from the podcast. He's just he's just recorded with her and published. Um, and she basically just said what a lot of people have said: that yes, it was disappointing, but there's a brilliant opportunity here for women's rugby. Um, there's a lot of mirroring that's gone on with games being played at the same time as the men's and kickoff times being very unsociable at like half hour kickoff times. Correct me if I'm wrong, Charlie, for some of these women's games, and it's like. 
people aren't even finishing work and people might not even be walking through the door and you, you it's England versus France in the sixth or whatever it might be. Um, and I think, you know, the frustration bits of which Berth said was that there had been no clarity. It was like, we're going to postpone it and there's not really going to be a date. And as you say there, Joe, hopefully we'll get the date today for, for when it's going to take place. But what she has been positive to hear is that the organisers are discussing that this isn't a new conversation that's just been happened because of COVID. It has been in the pipeline, but maybe the silver lining of COVID will give the women's game an opportunity to really shine because it absolutely deserves to. And if there's a year that the women's game needs to shine even more so it's 2021 you know we've got the world cup fingers crossed in september which is going to be fantastic and if the six nations can be on in april may time what an appetizer that's going to be for such a big 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 year for women's sports so burford was obviously very positive about it and um, amber reed was the same when i had a little chat with her as well so i think the overriding view and, and charlie will, will know probably better than i do that there is this opportunity that hopefully women's rugby and the organizers of the six nations can see which can only do positive things yeah, I think you're very right because I think the frustration from speaking to a few of the girls I know and then being a fan of it was that it was we're postponing it and there was no but this is our plan. There was murmurs what the plan was. I think they should have been better at we're postponing it, but actually we've got a plan in place and here it is. So it didn't feel like an afterthought. But I especially after speaking to Rachel, it got me excited about the thought of I do think having it separate would be a good idea. I think you get more people watching because you think at the moment, the under 20s, the women's and the men's all go on the same weekend. Now, rugby fans, if you're a rugby fan, will want to watch them all, but you, you just can't because you have a life to live. And like I said about the unsociable times, well, the women's are normally going on at either midday, which actually people are still doing their morning stuff. People are getting their stuff done before before the rugby and the same inverted comments for the, what's viewed as the main event, which is the men. So people are still, they're too busy to do it then. Or like you say, five, six, seven o'clock in the evening when actually people then are having their dinner at the weekend or they're actually setting down like sport. You watch your sport at, in the middle of a Saturday or middle of a Sunday. That, that's kind of when you go around and sit down and watch a sport. And as a rugby fan, that's when the men's rugby's on at the moment. Or let's be honest, unless you have an, a vested interest in the women's game, 99% of rugby fans, if they're often a men's game or a women's game, at this moment in time, are going to choose a men's because it's higher profile. They know the players. It's what they're used to. So I think we've got to give them the women's rugby is on now and there's no rugby against it. So if you want to watch some rugby, it's there for you now and go and watch it because it's great. And actually then you'll start to build a fan base when it's not in competition with itself almost in another game of rugby. So I think that I think it's it's been forced by COVID, as you said. Um, but I think it's a really exciting opportunity. I want to see three o'clock Saturday afternoon, England versus France women on BBC One, on ITV One, on the main channels. With the, with the same production value and the same um, everything that the men's game has in the situation we're going to watch now and give it its first time of a fair crack and just see the viewer numbers and see the interest because I, I genuinely think with a fair crack like that, it, they'll be through the roof. I think as well, I think we saw that, didn't we, probably Charlie in the autumn. I know the games were, as you quite rightly said, midday, but the viewing figures from both of those games that England played against France were astounding. And if that's a taste of what's to come, I think you're absolutely right with what you said. No, definitely. And it's something that's going to be obviously carried on to be covered by Talking Rugby Union all the way throughout this year and beyond. Um, but I suppose we might as well get to the topic of conversation for today, which is everything that's kicking off. Saturday, isn't it? There's no Friday game this year, it's, so it's kind of straight into the weekend. Uh, we're starting off, well, we'll just review every team, but we'll start off with England, because I think that's a friendly, easy one for us all to kind of go with. Um, England's first squad is going to be announced tomorrow from the day of recording, so the, today of the day that the podcast is going to be released. Um, there's not really loads to say about this England squad. I think the key things are Apollo, Dogwu and Tom West and, and Harry Randall. They've all been called up for the first time. Joe Marley, he's not going to be in the squad because he's decided not to go because of the COVID um, kind of implications that come with the extended travel times. Uh, Joe Launchbury's injured, Sam Underhill is injured, which means that Charlie Ewells and Jack Willis were replaced then. Courtney Laws is back and Jonathan Joseph is admitted from the squad entirely. He's, he's part of the shadow squad, which means he could get called up because he's on the same testing schedule. Who should we go with first? We'll go with Charlie. What, what are your thoughts about this England team? Well, first of all, there, Joe, when you were saying about Joe Launch being injured, so it meant that Charlie, for a second, I thought you were about to tell me I've been called up to England and this was how Eddie decided is to help me. Is this an exclusive uh, now? I was like, wow, well, I need to get I need to get down to Penny Hill, don't I? Um, but no, um, I, mate, I obviously have personal relations 
to it, uh, to Paolo and Harry and Harry Randall. Uh, played with them both in Boston had with Harry, uh, Leicester with Paolo. Um, three players both probably stay close to Paolo, and I've seen Paolo's job. I'm so excited for him. So after him, the way he's been playing this season has just been phenomenal. And last time I was on, we spoke about Eddie picking on form uh, with certain players. Um, I'm going to say what I said last time, Sam Simmons, I don't know what you have to do. But <laughs> aside from that, and um, Ben Spencer, but aside from that, to see him, see Paolo play so well, Consistently, and then to go, yeah, I'm going to give him a go. I just really hope he's in the 23 for the weekend. I'd be desperate to see him play. Um, and the same with Rands, actually. But no, I think it's, again, you see the embarrassment of Richards that England have at their disposal, especially in the back five of the scrum, when you look at the players who were injured and then you look at the players who aren't even making the shadow squad. And actually, it's it's just incredible. So I think England, England or France will be able to sure we'll get into France, will be my favourites going into it. Uh, but it's going to be, I think it's a very good tournament. But yeah, that England squad, there's been, like you say, there's some big names have been omitted, but if he's picking on form, there's not too many I think you'd have differently. Mm, definitely. And obviously, one of your former coaches, he's involved with the team now, Ed Robinson. Yes. He, he got yeah. pulled up because Jason Riles, he didn't want to travel from Australia. Again, same as Joe Marley, extended travel time. Uh, what, what's Ed like as a character? What does he kind of offer around the camp? Oh, mate, if you think I love rugby, you haven't spoken to Ed Robinson. <laughs> oh, you've never met someone who loves rugby more. Obviously, huge rugby family. You can tell that they've just talked about rugby their whole lives. But no, he's a great guy, mate. Um, he very much changed the style of play we had at Jersey. Uh, he, wants, he, wants to, he wants to play the beautiful game. He wants to play attractive rugby. Sometimes it's quite frustrating being coached by him <laughs> because you're like, Ed, it doesn't work like that on a pitch. Like, you'll, you'll carry from the halfway and he would be like, Okay, you made two or three meters. Why, why haven't you scored? I'm like, well, you can't from the halfway end. He's like, but no, go and score the try. That's what he's doing. He's like, go and score, go and finish, go and do it. And he's very much wants to empower players to go and do that. So, honestly, that's where I saw that news. Obviously, I was shocked because it came out of nowhere, but really excited for him, really pleased for him. Uh, and hopefully, he um, will have a really good experience there and um, leave his mark. But no, he, um, he'll want the game to be played in an attractive manner. He likes, he likes the beautiful game, which is, as a fan, that's what you want to see, isn't it? Yeah, of course, especially after the way the autumn went. Um, Chris, uh, something that came out yesterday, so Tuesday, was that John Mitchell had signed a new two and a half year contract, which will keep him with England till the uh, well until the closing of the twenty twenty three World Cup. How important do you think he is to the squad, and and what Eddie Jones wants to do as a team? Because it seems like as soon as he came in, there was this massive kind of shift in the intensity of the defence in particular. Yeah, I think you're exactly right, Joe. I think what we did see, as as you said there before, that. You know, the autumn might have been a bit drab for, for some, but what we did see is how England were in defence. And it's quite clear that he, the impact that he's had uh, on the team um, and, and, and and Eddie is using him as I think I think the Telegraph wrote something today saying that he's Eddie's lieutenant, isn't he? Um, and England have, have really, really based their, their game on that. And I think what we have seen is not only has the team evolved, I think he might have evolved as a coach as a bit and... I think some of those players themselves in the England team, yes, they're going to develop in the premiership environments with the coaches, but if you look at probably England's back row as well, I might be wrong if I say this, but they were not as influential as they were four or five years ago before John, I think Mitchell came, was it 2017, 2018? And I think what he's done, not only with the team defensively, but also with individual players, is making England tick and into this machine that, yes, they might not play pretty rugby, but they all do the basics right. I think it's massive for, for Eddie to have that. And when we talk about Ed coming in and a bit of a, you know, difficulties with the coaches because of COVID, to have someone like John Mitchell Mitchell there that Eddie can bounce ideas off, I think is is only going to go one way and it's going to be positive for England. And I don't think England have had any sort of backward steps with, with him in charge of that aspect of the game. So, yeah, really pleasing that he signed on again. And um, I think Eddie will be delighted as well that everything will be building towards 2023 with with Mitchell at his side. What, what do you think, lads? How do you think England will be affected by the fact, obviously, there's a core of Saracens players there who haven't played since the Autumn Cup? What do you think... Do you think that's going to affect them hugely? Like you look at the spine of the team is Saracens, really. If we're being honest, you've got your um, obviously hooker, line out, main line out jumper, caller. If Launchbury's not there, probably Atoja be calling the line outs. Billy at eight. I know he played against Ealing the other week, but he's had one hit out since the autumn. And then Farrell, amongst others. Like that's there's some big players in this team that haven't played any proper competitive rugby for 
three, four months now. Do you think, do you think that's going to have an effect? Well, it's a funny one. So I was on the one of the England calls last week, I can't remember which one it was, uh, and Jamie George was up for, for talking about it. And obviously, he, he's one of those players that he hasn't played since the 66 minute or something like that against France in that game. And he just talked about they were just on a S and C program to get ready for Test match rugby. So they they basically lessen the load in terms of a week to week, but they've probably been doing more loading in, in order to get ready for the games. They've just been conditioning themselves to play Test match rugby, which they wouldn't ordinarily get the opportunity to do. So I think they're actually going to come into it. I think we're going to see them really fit and really quite keen because they wouldn't usually get the opportunity to to not train at all in some weeks with Saracens. It's certainly my opinion of it, and I think. I think we're hopefully going to see Owen Farrell look a bit refreshed because he's played so much rugby in the last 10 years. So we, I, I think he's actually going to be quite, I'm quite excited about it because Billy, I think Jamie made the joke that he's not one for running up and down the field. He, he just wants to play rugby. Um, so, I mean, personally, I'm, I'm quite excited to see what the Saracens boys do because they're going to just, have, they're just going to have all this pent up energy, I think. I, I think Joe's absolutely right there, but maybe two things which I think will maybe, uh, spur the lad, Saracens lads on. I think one's the winning mentality. I think they've that's something that they've it's been ingrained in them, and they will come into big pressure games knowing, yeah, we know what to do. We've been here before. We've done it at club level. We've done it internationally. No reason why we can do it again after a long layoff. And I think the second thing is that carrot of the Lions tour. I think you got yeah. players in their own rights. It's, as you've listed them off there, Charlie, told you, Farrell, George, whatever, they should be going anyway to South Africa or Australia or the British Isles, wherever the Lions tour might be. <laughs> but that's the, that should be their carrot anyway, because you will have players like Luke Cowan, Dicky, knocking, banging at the door, going, you know, I've been playing for a, a double winning team last year and I've been playing consistent rugby. Why am I not getting ahead of Jamie George? And maybe that sort of pressure in the squad will push these guys onto the next level. And People will be right. I think you're right, Charlie. People will be cautious to see, well, these lads haven't played it. It will be, what can we expect against uh, Finn Russell or Stuart Hawk, who have been playing consistently at club level? But I think the flip side is these guys know how to win and they have the chance to, to have a big, big year again with the Lions. So uh, their mentality is going to be huge. And I think that will come to the fore, hopefully, from an England perspective on, on Saturday evening. Uh, and just kind of to, to wrap this up, it's going to be good because Ben Obano looks like he's actually going to get a cap after I think three or four years of kind of <laughs> sat there in the in the wider training squads. Who else? Charlie Eels is probably going to gain a bit more experience. Uh, I think the main thing is just seeing what Eddie Jones does in regards to his back row because Courtney Laws or Maratoji can play there. Uh, and with Sam Underhill injured, I think probably one of the most natural decisions is to shift Tom Curry to the uh, open side and then put Billy at eight. I don't have just a big hitter at six. Um, don't know about anyone else, but England's still kind of overwhelming favourites for me to to win a th- uh, fourth Six Nations in six years. On that on that back row, Joe, I'd really like to see Jack Willis play. Yeah, I know he got called up because of the injury. I'd really like to see him. But I think he's. I know it's another um, Jackler in the back row, but they normally play with Curry and Underhill, so I think that would disrupt the England game plan less. Looking from the outside in, of that's what they're used to in the back row. Um, I think he's phenomenal. I just think yeah. he's exceptional. I think the way, especially, he ended last season, since basically how he's played since the first lockdown, and the fact that I'm saying the first lockdown is incredible. That's a different conversation. <laughs> but since since rugby restarted uh, at the end of last summer in August, he's just he's been for me the form back row in England. So yeah. I'd really like to see him get a crack uh, on Saturday. Uh, but to answer your actual question again, I've done that. You didn't ask that question, but I've jumped in. Um, yeah, I think. England would be the favourite to me as well. And I'm going to say, but I'm going to say the most cliche rugby saying in the history of the world, <laughs> and we all know what it is, across the whole Six Nations, it depends what France turns up. Yeah, definitely I think, does. Because I think on their day, they'll beat anyone comfortably. I think they're, and they're so much fun to watch. Mm. They are, in inverted commas, a proper French team at the moment, aren't they? <laughs> yes. They really are. Yeah. Uh, and, and speaking of the old UA, um, I think the, the big thing for France at the moment is that they're going to be missing Rimi Vakatawa and Roman Entomac as they're both injured. Vakatawa with a knee injury. And I think Entomac is just reoccurrence of the injury that kept him out of yeah. the autumn, which is a, obviously a massive shame. Um, Chris, you, you, you know, you know, you know, Sean, Sean Edwards. So, you know, text pals. conversations. Yeah, exactly. Um, I will read you one. Well, sorry, Joe. I will read you all of the text he sent me the other week because I wanted to try and do an interview with him again. And we did one. He said, "Oh, thanks for your time, Sean." He just said, "Mercy, mercy, <laughs> mate." But no, he said, "Yeah, sorry, go on, Joe." No, I was going to say you obviously we obviously saw from France last year this kind of re 
I don't know how to describe it, kind of rejuvenated defence that we mm. hadn't actually ever really seen before in the last, I mean, probably since they last won the Six Nations in 2010, where we didn't actually, we actually got to see a French defensive front that aside from one or two mishaps in terms of punching Jamie Ritchie, for example, <laughs> um, aside from that one incident, um, France looked hugely impressive in defence and obviously Sean has to take pretty much all the plaudits for that, surely. Yeah, um, I was on the Six Nations launch last week and uh, got to the French, obviously French section and Fabien Geltier was there and sort of asked him the question about sort of where France were at. And he kept using this phrase, the project, the project, the project. So mm. I just asked him about the influence Sean had and he was like, well, yeah, Sean's a massive part of the project. And you can see kind of the, the influence he's had. I mean, as you say, Joe, straight away, sort of in the Six Nations last year, he's a man that doesn't look like you want to mess with him. But what, he, what I think he has done, which everyone will talk about, yeah, look at the great defence, but he's embraced the French lifestyle. You know, he lives over there now. He does all his coaching sessions in French, all the analysis meetings in French, the best he can. Um, he, he, you know, he's settled over there. And he what he said, actually, in his own words, were you do get coaches who will go over to a foreign country and not kind of embrace it and kind of maybe step away and do the bare minimum. He's just kind of gone, well, if I'm going to make this work, I'm going to make this opportunity work, I've got to throw myself into it. And that is clearly rubbed off on the team. But as a, as a player, obviously, I don't know, having played one and a half games at Wilmsville High School, but as a player, if someone knows your culture and gets, gets what you are as a person and you are as a team, I think as players, you're going to automatically respond to that because they would have been used to French coaches, the French style. And if Sean comes in, a lad from Wigan comes in to try and sort your defence out and actually understands you as players and has that personal relationship, I think is is massive for France. And it's absolutely helping. I think Galtier gets it as well. Um, and we're seeing now these young players getting a chance and thriving. I know you probably couldn't come on to uh, people like Jelly Bear as well, Joe. But these lads are getting a chance. They look like they're enjoying the rugby playing for France. And as as Charlie said, they, they do look a bit changed. And if they do sort out that discipline and, you know, don't press the red button when something happens and they go and lash an elbow in someone's face, they can really they can really challenge England. And I don't think England are overwhelming favourites because of the, the quality and the depth France were able to show in the autumn as well. And kind of speaking of that Autumn Nations Cup final, and this kind of relates into this point, they've got five uncapped players in that squad from what I could work out from the press release, which was just a picture of the of the of the squad, which which wasn't great. Um and you know, if we look at the halfbacks, for example, Matthew Jalabert and Louis Carbonell, between them have got 10 caps, which when you think that's that's your two tens that you can rely on for the entirety of a Six Nations tournament, there, there's not much experience there before. But however, the the real kind of thing that kind of sticks sticks in your mind is that they didn't have many caps at all in that entire squad that took England into extra time. Charlie, when you were watching that, what was going through your head as someone who's probably, you know, played against some of these lads when they were kind of age grade and you were in England under 20? Uh, my first worry that was that someone had uh, held a gun to uh, Owen Farrell's head and told me he had to start missing kicks. Uh, I was worried about that for a second, but... Um, no, it was great to see, like you say, a lot of those lads are names I recognise of playing at 18s, 20s, um, playing against them. Uh, Dupont has made me look like a mug many occasion in England and France. And you say about the two tents being so young and lack of experience, I think even though Dupont is my age, I actually think he's young. I think he's 23, 24. I think he's a year younger than me. Mm. Um, actually, he's incredibly experienced. Now, look how long he's been playing for Toulouse and how many caps he's got. So, Having him inside them, who he just he is the petit general, isn't he? He just runs their game. That will really make it easier for those tens. But no, it's nice for me, having been a young player, frustrated at times, to see them put faith in. If you're good enough, you're old enough. Mm. It was just nice to see them do that. And actually, yeah, obviously, I wanted England to win that Nations Cup. I'm English. Obviously, I wanted that. But once they'd won, and I could look back on the game, it was nice to see a young side who no one expects anything of, never expect them to be rolled over, go out there and do a job. Uh, it was part of we didn't we didn't win, but that Gloucester team that I was in that went down to Exeter, we played their team that started the European final bar one because of the way they were they were rotating their their strongest team and second team, and we were rotating the other way. So I was in our second team, we went down and played them, and we pushed them close. And it's such a great feeling to be in a side like that, and it's nice to see young players go and have the attitude of we've got them to lose, we're going to throw course to the wind, we're going to play our rugby, we're going to we're going to see what sticks. And they were that close, weren't they, to beating England in that final? So, obviously, massively pleased England won. 
Um, but it was nice to see a young side do well against the odds. Yeah, no, definitely was. Um, obviously, last year we only really got to see a snapshot of the full capability of this team because because of their selection issues, which was that you know you can only select certain players for three games and they had to go back to their clubs. Such was the agreement between LNR and FFR. I thought I stumbled on that, but I didn't. Um, so do we all feel that this is the opportunity for Galtier to choose who are his kind of key men, injury, injury permitting, that are going to take him forward to the World Cup? Because it seems like two and a bit years away, that doesn't seem like it's that far at all to, to a World Cup in your home country, in your own backyard. Uh, we'll start with Charlie. Uh, yeah, I think he has to now. I think, as Chris said, he was talking about the project. I think your project has to be World Cup to World Cup, doesn't it? You say the... They lost 12 months effectively of what they would have planned to be doing, you'd imagine, with COVID and those agreements you were talking about, etc. So I think you've got to now start thinking, OK, I need to start putting my partnerships together here and have the long view of who's going to who who's going to be my team to go and try and win a World Cup at home. And if they get it right, and Chris talked about they seem a different side at the moment, they get that discipline right. If Sean can get them as excited about defence as they are in attack, which it seems like he is, they're going to be a real player at that World Cup. They're a strong side. I think, yeah, I think they might be getting the timing right of those players now. You blood them now. Two years' experience of Test rugby is a it's, you're a completely different animal. So I think um, I think yeah I think you've got to start looking now. At, okay, who are the ones who I think are going to take me forward to the next World Cup, and who are the ones who maybe aren't, and starting to uh, sort them uh, them from each other. I think now. Chris, much the same thoughts there. Yeah, I think so. I think it, the times now. I think we will go on to Wales and we will go on to Ireland, but Galtier comes in, in in a similar kind of vein, doesn't he? France, new start, Ireland, new start, Wales, new start. And he's used 2020 as a really good opportunity to get some of these young lads in. And the Autumn Nations Cup was probably, that was what it was there to do, really. I know England had a different approach to, to get results. And we as England fans, you know, if you look back on it, brilliant, with two trophies last year. But I think France did have to, in a little bit of a way, were forced to use some of the other players because of the... The, the rule in, in the top 14, but they've used it well. I think they they used last year extremely well. They would be disappointed not to have got over the line and, and won the six stations at the first time masking. But as Charlie said, this is now all building towards the World Cup to World Cup. And a six nations is a big, big opportunity to put a marker down. And if France do and go, go win it, then it's like everyone stands up and takes notice of them a little bit more. I know there's a lot of excitement around it at the moment, but if you're an Australia or New Zealand fan, you're looking at the six nations and go, oh, England won again. That's who we have to be worried about. And I think if France do put in a performance against England or it's quicker and whatever it is next month and do go and win the Six Nations, everyone just stands up and takes notice of the host nation and go, hang on a minute, they mean business again. And that's what they need to do because, yes, we're excited by them, but can they go and deliver now? And I think that will definitely just uh, hold them in good stead and get that winning habit going towards the autumn, towards the next couple of Six Nations and obviously building towards their own World Cup in uh, two years' time. Also, I think you said earlier, Joe, the last the last six nations they won was twenty ten. I think you said France. Fun. France is a proud rugby nation. Like mm. rugby, you only have to look at the crowds they get in Pro D two and even National League when they have crowds. So you see what rugby means to them. They will be hurting with that, and the French public will be looking at this team going, "We need to win something here." And I think there will be pressure on for the public that this is a year they can win. Whether it maybe comes a season or two too early for them to be real contenders this year, you don't know, but. They will be smart in the fact they haven't won one for 11 years. That's honestly, I, did, I didn't realize it was that long until you said it then. That's ridiculous. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, and we'll move on now to Ireland. Um, the real big note I've put here is that Paul O'Connell's joined them as a Fords coach. That's pretty big. Yeah, so you'd like to hope their line out will be really good now because he was <laughs> he was really good at line outs. He was good. No, I don't think. The kind of flight, like I came with this excited to talk about England, France, and then Wales, and everything that's going on there. So actually, Ireland are kind of just, I don't mean this in disrespect at all, but kind of just there, aren't they? But actually, they're kind of just there, but they're always really hard to beat. They're always a good side. They've got some incredibly talented players. Uh, and on their day, could definitely beat anyone. So I think they're probably flying under the radar a little bit, which I'm not sure they'll mind. You don't mind that at all. You, you go about your business, and then you turn up and you surprise people. So it'll be, um, it'll be interesting to see how they go. I think... I don't expect them to win it, but I think they, um, they'll they be a tough team to beat like they always are. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think the, uh, one of the big lines I've written down here is that Tag Furlong's back. That's quite an important thing. You know, tight head, you know, 
great hands, this, that, and the other. Uh, they're missing Quinn Rue and Kaylin Doris. They're the real big misses for this round in particular. Jacob Stockdale's actually injured as well, which means that fullback is that that kind of race is completely blown open again. Uh, do we feel like uh, Chris, they, they're going to rely on Connor Murray and Johnny Sexton too much again to kind of be the players they were maybe two, three years ago and not necessarily the players they are now. That's the worry, isn't it? That's the worry of your Island fan. That I think what they've got to get away with is, I'll get away from, sorry, is the Joe Smith era. That's something they need to get away from. Um, yes, they made great steps forward, you know, Grand Slams and, you know, he had a massive impact on Irish rugby. What, what I think Andy Farrell started to kind of do is just put his imprint on it. And this is now an opportunity. I said an opportunity for France to, to go on and make a statement. I think in a way for Ireland as well, that Andy Farrell's, this is my team now. And yes, Sexton and Murray do play a big part, but there might be games where Johnny Sexton's injured. I know he's carrying an injury. He's had last week, he's hoping to be fit for, for, um, for the majority of the six days as well. And hopefully that doesn't rear its head again, but it, they might be without them and Farrell has to find a way of, of coping without them. And I think, I think he will. They've got some great players coming through. I mean, you know, being a rugby nerd that I've, I've started to become recently, I managed to watch some of the highlights. I think it was one, it was on a Friday or a Saturday afternoon, the, the Ulster A game against Leinster A, I think they played the other week. Wow. And some of the, wow. Hang on, Chris. Hang that on, Chris. That is that's, that's deep into rugby. If you're watching the A game, you're finding footage it was of the, the A games. It, it was the highlights <laughs> on uh, the BBC. And I was like, oh, I'll give it a watch. Let's have a look. But some of the young players, they had looked pretty decent. That I've been slating now for doing a bit of research for a podcast that I knew was coming <laughs> three weeks ago. So will you stop me such a professional Chris Hill, it's making the rest of us all look bad. I'm far from a professional. Um, I, only watched, I only watched one game last weekend. <laughs> um, but no, it was just it was just popped up on the sides of it, and it was like you know ten minutes or something like that. And they just seem to have a lot of depth in um, in that in some of the young players coming through. And I, I do think some of these young players can shine for Andy Farrell. But going back to the Six Nations, yeah, just put his imprint on it. And if, if he starts to implement a style, because he said himself, "Oh, I'm not that far away." He doesn't think Ireland that far away of closing the gap between France and. And England, so it will be interesting to see how they go. I don't, I agree with John. I don't feel they'll win it, but they could really, really, you know, just show what what they're about. And um, it'd be interesting, really. I do think they might be dark horses, though, but I don't think they'll go all the way. No. Um, another team is, you know, in the Six Nations. Another team is Scotland. Um, what's that, the key that, thing? To that it? is a fact, Joe Harvey. That is a fact. What you've said there. Another team in the Six Nations is Scotland. I Are know. they? Yeah, brand new, brand new in it, you know, just just since 1903 or something like that, I don't know. Um, oh, yeah, it's 150 years of the RFU, isn't it, this week? Probably should mention that. Um, 150 years since the first Scotland-England game, isn't it? Yeah. So, oh, yeah, they're wearing that old kit, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, less said about that. Um, <laughs> um, big thing for Scotland, they've got Finn Russell back. I think that's quite... An exciting thing. Obviously, only got to play, I think, about an hour, hour's worth of rugby, if that, international rugby, uh, last season because of his um, falling out with Gregor Townsend. That, that wasn't a great way to start last year's um, tournament. What else we got here? Cam Redpath looks like he might make his debut. He's, I think he's 20 now, something like that, Chris? Yeah, I think he's, he's, still, he's still a young lad, isn't he? Um, I mean, we saw him two years ago, maybe, at Bedford in the pouring rain. Um, and he played again. I think they were playing Italy, weren't they, in the under yeah. 20s? And he had a, he had another brilliant game. I think he was given one of the match by Will Greenwood that day. Um, and I think it is one that potentially got away from England. Um, he's obviously had a little bit of, of time at sale where he didn't think his career was going to go the way he wanted it to. And he, he said the other week that he owes sale a lot for his development. He owes Steve Diamond a lot. But Bath has seemed to have given him a new lease of life. And there was always that debate of, playing for Scotland at one age grade, playing for England at another bit. Now he looks like he's made his choice. And, and similar to what we talked about with Paolo Adogru at the start, um, and we, I think everyone on this podcast hopes, you know, we get, Paolo gets a chance to really showcase what he's about. I think Cam will get a really good chance to, to show what he's about. And I think, I don't, know, I don't know who said it, it was on BT Sport. It was a really good point. It might have been Hugo Monia. And he said, if Ali Price, Finn Russell and Cam Redpath can build a good relationship, mm. that's exciting for Scotland. That is really, really, and you've got, you know, Darcy Graham in there, Blair, Blair King on. They've got some absolute electric players in there, Cam being one of them. And it'd be interesting to see if, he, if Greg Old Townsend goes with them on Saturday. That would excite Scotland massively. And I think it just gives an extra needle, a little bit of an edge to the game as well. If, if Cam Redpath will start against England, then maybe he'll think, 
maybe Greg will think it's a perfect scenario to chuck him in. This is Cam Ref giving the Cam Redpath giving two fingers up to Eddie Jones saying, "Look, you should have picked me." So it might work in Scotland's favour, but I think it's a brilliant, brilliant bit of, bit of work for Scotland to get him in the squad and getting capture on the Six Nations, and it's definitely exciting times. Yeah, definitely. I'm just trying to think uh, what else I've got written down here. Another man who put the the two fingers up to Eddie, Gary Graham. He's likely to be playing eight because they kind of haven't really tied that one down with the World Cup. A couple of years away, uh, Duran van der Merwe, he's going to be probably quite exciting again. We're going to see a lot more of him next season because he's signed for Worcester Warriors. Um, one thing for me, and this is something I want to ask you, Charlie, more than anything, a lot of the England-based players, they had to play for their teams at the weekend. What, what are your thoughts on that? Because you've seen the England lads, they're not getting, you know, they're not getting released back to their clubs in between. It, it, it's an interesting one because... You don't you don't want to go into the Six Nations tired, do you? You don't want to tire. But also, if you're in if you're in good form, you don't want to stop playing. Um, there's nothing more frustrating. I think I, I find it when I play the twenty stuff. You'd you'd be playing well. You'd um, you play your first two Six Nations game. You'd be in good form, and then you go back to the time as Leicester for me. And we'd have a we'd have a game that weekend, and you get the blocks put on your play. And you're like, well, I do understand it, but can we not just look after my training a little bit in the week? Maybe let me go because I'm I'm in a good role. I don't want to break it up. So. I think it'd be an individual basis on how the players feel. Some will want to play, some won't. Um, I think it's different in the middle of the tournament uh, because I think actually sometimes it's less the physical side, more the mental rest of actually having a mo- having a week off mentally from having to get prepared for a game. I think especially it's tough for you go and play for Scotland on a Saturday and then you know, let's use Cam Redpath, for example, you then have to get down to Bath on the, on the uh, Sunday. You have to go from all your Scottish calls, all your Scottish players, everything in Scotland, back into Bath for a week. You have to do all that and then flip back. That's really hard mentally. So I think the mental side of things is why I think once I was in a tournament at the top level like that, I'd want to stay in that. I'm going to use the word bubble, not a COVID bubble, but as in a bubble of I'm playing for Scotland now. Obviously, the England players do. Um, Scottish players are a bit tougher for, but that that I guess they know that when they sign in England and that's why a lot of them play in Scotland. Yeah, no, definitely will be. Um I think another thing is the hooker battle because David Cherry and Ewan Ashman are likely to be involved with the squad because of Stuart McAnally's injury, which apparently did some dodgy lift in the gym, so he's hurt his neck, so he can't actually play for a couple of weeks. Uh, so he'll be they'll be behind George Turner and or Grant Stewart uh, as they look for selection. Uh, what else have we got down here? But it's been a pretty poor poor year for form for the Scottish teams as a whole in the Pro 4 team. Glasgow are fourth in Conference A and Edinburgh are fifth in, pool, in Conference B. I need wrote. I wrote two different definitions for the pools. Um, what else have we got? Oh, shall we move on to everyone's favourite topic? Wales. They're the most they're the most pressed team in the Six Nations. <laughs> what have we got? How disappointed would they be after last season's showing? They won three out of ten international fixtures last year. They've not selected Reese Webb. Ken Owens is back. Um, what else have we got in here? Dan Lydia has been called up for the first time since 2018. I'm not gonna lie, didn't know he was still playing. I love Dan Lydia, but I, I, I thought he'd retired. No, uh, no, no. I genuinely thought he'd retired. That that is genuine news to me. That's how much attention I've been paying recently. Yeah, um, just been trucking away for the Ospreys, I understand. Mm. I, th- I think a few injury issues, and I think that's the key thing. I think they want to make sure at the age of 33 that he's been a couple of years injury free before recalling him back. But obviously, he was. Six Nations player of the tournament in 2012, I think, when Wales won it. I think that was around the right time. It's then or Great 2013. Knowledge. That is that's well, that, that's impressive. Oh, not mate, quite yeah. watching A League Irish. Yeah, football. no, but Chris, but Chris, you can watch all your A League Irish you want. I want facts like that. That's what I want <laughs> brought out. I need to talk again. No, mate, just just I just go on Sky Sports and just read it. That's fine. <laughs> on Wales, it's interesting because, like you say, obviously they've come out of the Gatland area area era. Um, and it, it hasn't gone how Pivac would have wanted, has it? Um, so I think the question you ask is, let's say they have a terrible Six Nations. Let's say they lose to everyone but Italy, because they're probably going to beat Italy. But let's say they might even be, lose to Italy. But let's say they have a bad Six Nations, and they go from 3-10 and 10 to maybe 4-15. and 15. What do you do if you're the Welsh, or if you're WR, are you? Because you're now two years out from a World Cup, two and a bit years. Do you stick with him and risk another third bad year and you've got three awful years in a row up to a Six Nations? Or do you make that tough decision? Now, if it was football, I know what would happen. But in rugby, they stick with Coach Flung. But if you do two bad international seasons on the bounce, can you take that risk going into a World Cup? After you've had so much success for so long under Gatland, 
can you take that risk or do you have to go, look, this isn't working? I think it's really interesting because I think, I think, I don't know what they do because like I say, if it was football, I'd know in a heartbeat. You see it all the time. We don't, we don't seem to do it in rugby, but with such big stakes, would, would the Welsh, would, would WRU give him another shot or would they cut the losses and find someone else? Mm. Well, I was thinking about something similar to this the other day and I don't know about anyone else, but I feel like because of the nature of 2019 to 2020, you know, there's a very short break between the, the end of the World Cup and the start of the Six Nations. So you're already kind of on the back foot there bringing in a new coaching staff. But then what COVID's done, it's taken out all those summer internationals where you're probably going to get five, maybe six games if you're Wales, because they always have that one outside of the international window. But then you obviously missed out on your autumn internationals as well. Yes, they probably played roughly the same amount of games. But because of COVID, you might not necessarily have got to see everyone or the, the fact is of the way the game was played that you get to see so many Welsh players, you know, kind of week after week in the Premiership and then in the Pro 14, it kind of creates more questions than it answers because you're thinking, well, he could be, you know, getting up pretty well, you know, he could be conditioned quite well by 2023. And the windows have just been all really pushed together, which means that it's become so intense mm. and just so kind of, everyone's looking at it again because there's no one, you know, we all know there's no one in the grounds really watching it. So you're all kind of watching it on the telly and it's just added to all this pressure and, this, this is going to be felt in the Welsh, the WRU boardroom because they're the same as us. They're kind of become fans now. They're not as involved with the game as they probably would have liked. So for Pivak, he, he's just kind of come in a rubbish time, like just mm. one of the most awful times in history to, to ever, you know, take up a new job ever, probably. And yeah, you're taking over from Warren Gatland and it, it, it was always going to be terrible, but this window has just been so compressed and it's become so intense that it kind of feels like all it can be is failure and he's bringing in a whole new identity to this Wales team. Whereas Andy Farrell, he's really just carrying on from what Joe Schmidt did and just changing the gameplay slightly. I think what, it's me sitting on the fence a little bit, but what will make the decision if, if Charlie's right and it, it, it does go from, whatever you said there, Joe, three to 10 to four to 15 mm. wins from, from these test matches and there isn't any kind of clear signs of, well, he's trying something, he's developing a style of play. That's when I think, the WR you have to go. Well, yes, it's been tough. And what you said there, Joe, is absolutely spot on. Coming into a new job as a coach now, and over the last 12 months, it's been really, really tough. But the WR you have got to say, well, are we actually seeing any improvements? You know, he's, he's left a couple of names out. You mentioned Reese Webb there. I know uh, James Belper as well has been, been someone who seems to have shot in the Welsh press and they seem to be really happy with how the way he's been playing. So he's left a couple of those, those guys out. He's, he's made those big decisions. But if there's no identity, there's no progression on the pitch, are they just going to go, well, look, we're two and a half years out from the World Cup. We got to the semi-finals last year or two years ago. We need to make a decision. But if there is signs of making progress, I think you just stick with him. I think you have to stick with him. I think we've seen that a number of times in sport that – if you give coach time to develop a philosophy and develop an energy and, and a style of play, then you will nine times out of 10 get the rewards you want. And, and sport does take time. And Charlie's right, football's completely different. It'd be a knee jerk decision to be saw in football, Frank Lampard getting sacked. And he was actually building a, a way of Chelsea playing, but that's the way football is. And hopefully that doesn't happen for Pivac. And hopefully we do see from a Welsh perspective some, uh, some positive steps forward during the Six Nations. Mm. And it should be said, they are missing Rob Evans, Nicky Smith, Samson Lee, Ross Moriarty, James Davis, Ellis Jenkins, Gareth Anscombe, Reese Patchell, Scott Williams and Jonah Holmes through injury. But, you know, there is this positive. You can look at the players they're attracting back to Wales. For example, Will Rowlands, the, the Hammersmith Welshman, as we'll call him. Um, you know, he, he's coming back to, well, he's not, he's never lived in Wales, but he's going to Wales now to, to play his rugby for, I think it was Dragons or something like that. And then Will Griff John, who plays for Sale, he's signing for Scarlets. And Great name, that, by the way. Will Griff John. Will, Will Griff. <laughs> I want. I want to be in that in that na naming meeting. I don't think you have a formal meeting, Jamie Child. That conversation where the dad, the, the mum, I imagine, goes, "Let's call him Will," and the, the the dad goes, "Yeah, yeah, but we'll give him a we'll give him a longer name to be formal." The mum yeah. says, "Oh, w William." He says, "No, no, Will Griff." It's kind of sounds like something you'd say when you're having a sneeze as well. Yeah, it's just it's just excellent. And then I, I always enjoy people who have two um like you, Joe, two first names and both their names. I really enjoy that. Yeah. So the fact that he has John as his second name. The fact the fact that his name is not Will Griff John, 
yeah. always fa- baffles me. I'm, I'm going on about nonsense here, but I love it. I think it's one of my, it's one <laughs> it's my, fav- it's one of my favourite names in the world, Will Griff job. It's the key issue around Welsh rugby. It is. Yes, it is. It is. Well, it's quite funny because one of my middle names is a surname. Amazing. Well, that's it. Yeah. Excellent. And, but then Excellent. my surname is Harvey. So, um, but I'm not going to go into that because of... Um, Different I trust the listeners. Um, but the thing is, what we should say about Wales is they've still got bags of experience. Lee mm. Halfpenny, 93 caps. Liam Williams, 66 caps. George North is going to hit 100 caps in this tournament at the age of 20. How old is... Yeah, I was going to say... Was he bonkers. Bonkers. Completely insane. Uh, Jonathan Davies, 85 caps. And you've got to think that, in particular, Lee Halfpenny and um, Jonathan Davies, the injuries that they've had over the years that have kept them out for nine months at a time, 12 months at a time, for them to you know, be at that point, we've got the we've got Talupe Falatau, 81 caps, Dan Bigger, 87, Alan Wynne Jones, 143 test matches before we incorporate his Lions test caps. Just I, I don't I know I lads, I know how much it hurts to do 80 minutes in the second round. I know how you feel. I don't know how he's done it nine 150 times at a level that I can't, I don't know how it feels. I've never played test match rugby. He's, <laughs> he's, he's a phenomenon. Um, I think I have to say now, Joe, go through all that experience. Like they've got so much experience, so many great players. They have to, for me, Louis Rizami has to play. Yeah, He has to play. Now, I thought Louis was just quick. And when I say just quick, he is next level quick of you get these once a generation sort of quick. I saw him in training over 40 metres, leave Johnny May behind by about 10. He's, it's, I've never seen it like it. But I didn't fathom how good a football and rugby player he is till I trained with him and played with him. He's not just quick. The kid's yeah. the real deal. Um, I think they have to invest in him and he has to be in that back three because he is a game winner. It's not like you carry him as well because of his pace. He's, he's properly the real deal. I just want to go on record saying that, like, I thought he was just a quick kid really quick kid and then I played with him and I trained with him and actually know he's he's got a rugby brain he's a good football he's got good skills uh he's he's the real deal and Wales need to need to back him I think yeah four caps I think coming into this tournament um and he's joining kind of a list of guys like Kieran Hardy Johnny Williams Nick Tompkins Reese Carre and you know even Callum Sheedy who've all got very small number of caps so actually there's, there's so much ahead of them and I think that's probably the exciting thing for Wales going into this tournament is that they're going to see these guys grow I think that's exactly the point that I was trying to make but didn't make before about the kind of this this style that Pivax wants to implement. And he's got to give these guys a chance. Reese Amit, as Charlie said there, he's a game changer. You know, you give him the ball, something can happen in an instant. And that's maybe what Wales need. Maybe that's a, a little bit of spark they need to kind of move away from the era of Gatland into the Pivax era and give Tompkins a chance, give more of a chance, give Samet, Reece Samet a chance. There is some exciting players in there. It's whether, whether Pivax willing to give them a chance and unlock them and unlock their potential at test level. It, it's, a, it's a fine balance because Wales will want to get results, but at the same time, the only way they might get results is with these young players performing to the best of their ability. So as you say, Joe, it is exciting for Wales fans. It's just whether they're going to get to see a lot of them join the Six Nations. Yeah, uh, and we'll, we'll finish off with Italy before we have a... Well, I'll, I'll try and remember all the fixtures again. I tried to remember them yesterday and I just completely failed, to be honest. Um, uh, but Italy... What, well, what is there to say about Italy? I think it's the key thing. What is uh, there to say? I know what there is to say about Italy. I'm gonna, I said I'd shoot on it in, lads. I saw a stat. <laughs> Look at his face. Yes, I'm on. so excited. You are so no, happy. <laughs> because what is the say about Italy? I feel like we have the same conversation about Italy every year. Is this going to be the year where they build on those little performances where they show what they can do? And, oh, look, they've lost by 50 points. We're back where we started. No one really understands why, because they're too good to lose by 50 points. They are mm. too good to do that, but manage to every season. So I don't understand how. But they are missing Jake Pledry, which is a huge miss for them. And you only understand how much of a miss it is when I saw a stat, I retweeted it uh, last week. I think I'm going to get this right. He, since his debut, he has beaten twice as many defenders as anyone else in the Italy side. He's beaten 84 defenders, I believe the number was, and the next best is 42. Like, that's a ridiculous stat. And you don't realise how much they're relying on him for their front foot ball until you hear that. And how is that going to affect their attack again? Like they've got some other great back rowers, like Seb Negri, who I know is a friend of TRU, who's going to a lot as well. Yeah. It's great. And they've got the likes of Callum Braley, Stephen Varney, young scrum halves who 
or English Italian who I know who are really good professionals, really good players who given from football are dangerous, but you take someone who does that much for your side. I don't care. I don't care what side it is. It could be back in the day, New Zealand losing McCaw. It could be England losing Wilkinson further back. You lose someone who's that pivotal to you, that talismanic, it's going to have a huge knock-on effect, no matter who comes in and replaces them, no matter how good their replacement is. That's the sort of injury that really resonates across a whole side. Um, I think you have to look across sports. I'm going to get Liverpool in, Chris. We always manage to one way in the podcast. <laughs> you look at what losing Van Dijk did to Liverpool. Actually, the defence has been fine, but because it, the, it upsets the whole balance of the team, suddenly Liverpool can't score goals. So, actually, you take a defender at it, like, why has that happened? But it just, it completely knocks your balance when you lose someone like that. I've played in teams where you lose someone who is your big player, who is your talismanic man or your lead or your captain, and just nothing feels the same. So, it'll be interesting to see how they manage without JK, uh, because I don't think I fully appreciated how pivotal he was for them until I saw that. It's it's mind-boggling that one man has beaten twice as many as anyone else. That's that's almost unfathomable sorts of numbers. Yeah, it certainly is. And I think... Uh, one of the things we have to say is that, like so many of the teams at the minute, it seems like there's not a huge amount of experience across this Italy squad. There's only three, play- uh, four players, sorry, in the squad that have got more than 30 caps, which, you know, really, I mean, that's probably what, that's probably three, maybe four years playing kind of non-stop international rugby. Um, but for only four players in the entire squad to have that is um, not an ideal situation for Franco Smith. Um, they're kind of, putting a lot of hope onto the 20-year-old fly half Paolo Carbisi, who obviously played really well during the Autumn Nations Cup and at the latter end of the Six Nations, but you are still hoping to rely on a 20-year-old fly half who, who, let's be honest, all the tools aren't in his armour yet. Um, four uncapped players in the squad, not a huge amount of experience across that team. Chris, it feels really horrible to say it this early doors and often you kind of want to have this renewed optimism going into the Six Nations, but you kind of get the feeling that, unfortunately, it's going to be a wooden spoon again. Yeah, it, Charlie was right when he said before, we can say how much they have shown positive signs in the previous Six Nations or the autumn, that it's unfortunately the same old story. It's in that the, that uh, an experience to talk about, Joe, is interesting. Franco Smith said last week that those players have played more games for their franchises over the last year and a half than they have even been in Italy camps. And it made Italy appearance, and he, you know, it, that's that's what he said. That maybe it's slightly different with twenty twenty one. They have had that international experience now, and maybe it's a fresh start for them in twenty in twenty twenty one. And he's tried to stay clear of getting the monkey off the back, as he said about Italy need this win. It's been six Six Nations now, I think, since the last win, and he's tried to say, well, let's not talk about it. Let's take the pressure off and do. Just kind of focus on the, the the short-term outcome rather than long-term. So it's kind of like taking games 20 minutes at a time, making sure we perform to the best of our levels. Because he referred to the Autumn Nations Cup game against Scotland, where I think they were ahead for about an hour. And he said the final 20 minutes got away from him. And it's kind of that 80-minute performance. But how many times have we been saying that? It's about the 80-minute performance for Italy. And they've got some great young players there. And Franco Smith does say it's... a. Uh, it's a fresh start for the side, but it's going to be very, very difficult to see how their first win is, is going to come about because I do think Scotland are in a good place. I think Ireland are in a good place and obviously France and England, we said there, and maybe they may fancy a, a Wales side that are just still trying to find their feet, but I think it's going to be another tough campaign and it might be another learning curve for Italy. Yeah, it certainly seems that way. And Italy are the team that are opening the Six Nations on Saturday afternoon at quarter past uh, two uh, GMT kickoff. In case anyone else is listening, further afield than than Greenwich Mean Time. I don't know. Does that make sense as a phrase? Was that all right? Are we happy with that one? <laughs> it's been said now. It's been said. It's it's in the it's in the books. Uh, so that's Italy versus France. That's going to take place in Rome. And then after that, we have the Calcutta Club, C- Calcutta Cup clash between England and Scotland at Twickenham. A quarter to five kickoff is that one. Uh, and then also on Sunday, we have Wales versus Ireland, which is a 3 p.m. kickoff. Um, so we might as well kind of go with um, predictions for that first round. Chris, uh, who are you backing to win in Italy, France? France. Charlie? France. Yeah, France, three for three. Uh, England versus Scotland, Chris? 38, all draw. No, uh, England. <laughs> Charlie? England. 
Yeah, England's well, this is, this is a boring little bit of game of predictions already, isn't it? Yeah, they said it out, Joe. Yeah, probably will. Uh, we might as well finish it off, though, just in case. Uh, <laughs> Wales versus Ireland, Chris. Ireland. Ooh. Charlie. Ireland. <laughs> Do you know what? I'll go against the grain Wales. So that, you know, they're at home. The roof might be closed. You just love God's to keep, keep The roof will be closed to keep that atmosphere of all those, hang on, zero people in. Well, no, just in case, you know, the, the, the flame cannons just carry on going for a bit, something like that. Keep the heat in, you know. Oh, no. It's going to be, I mean, we hope everyone's staying safe and watching it from home and enjoying it in as best way that you can without being able to go to the games it's going to be a very different Six Nations this year as it was an Autumn Nations Cup at the tail end of last year um, many thanks to uh, Charlie Beckett for joining us you can catch his new podcast now Brew with Beckett which is on I think across all podcast platforms is it Charlie? Yeah it's on Apple Spotify and as I say if you want to have a watch of me for some reason it's also on YouTube um, so yeah Catch it there. And yeah, no, um, thank you for having me on, gents. It's been a uh, real fun. I always enjoy coming on just chatting with you. So um, anytime, I'm more than happy to. Thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate it. Chris, uh, there's plenty more to come on talking about being in this week, I believe. Yeah, we've got a lot of England, Scotland build up um, out there now as we record. Gary's done a bit of a fun piece with a, a number of Scotland fans that were at that famous Twickenham game uh, two mm. years ago. It's uh, really, it, to be honest, it's a really interesting read to see that a number of the fans were heading to the pub at halftime uh, but decided to, to, to stay. So it, that's really nice. He's with Scotland tomorrow or today, Gary. And we've got a column as well coming out with our new columnist, which will be revealed um, later in the week. Joe, you're with England, I know, um, tomorrow with the, with, the launch, with the squad announcement. So... Yeah. Um, looking forward to that see whether Eddie goes with Paolo or Dog Room the 23 we all have fingers crossed for that as well uh, we might have some Wales and Ireland content as well Friday and across the weekend plus all the Premiership as well as best we can with the resource we can at the moment and uh, yeah that's uh, all to come on talking with you over the next few days or so there's yeah. so much rugby lads there's so much rubbish. Might have to give the A-League a bit of a miss, I think. The Irish A-League might have to go the <laughs> this week. Yeah, I might, have to, might have to give her a miss for the next month or so. Oh, what a shame. They'll miss your viewing number, yes. Chris. Um, you know, <laughs> try and get out of single figures. Um, but yeah, no, thank you very much for listening and potentially watching this Talking Rugby Union podcast. Uh, I've been Joe Harvey. With, I've been joined by Chris Hill and Charlie Beckett. Please do review this podcast on your podcast platform. Um, that that helps apparently. I reviewed Charlie's the other day, trying to give him that little boost to just Thank try you. and boost him up. Yeah, there. I won't. I won't lie, Joe. I say it because I hear other podcasts who are far more successful than me say it. <laughs> I don't know how it helps, but I just say if you like, give us five star review and review. It really helps. <laughs> I don't know what it does, but apparently it does. So give this one a five star review. Yeah, there's a really unusual thing. I'll explain it off air because it's really boring and dull. But yeah, thank you very much for listening, and I'm sure you'll hear us next time.